Hi, podcast listeners. Welcome to the A World of Difference podcast. We have so many guests on this show making a difference in our lives, making a difference all around the world with the expertise that they bring. And yet so many of you are reaching out to me saying, you want more. It's not enough just what we're putting on these podcast episodes for you. And so I am here to extend a very warm welcome to you to our Difference Maker community where you can join for as little as $5 a month to get all this extra content out the gate, you're going to get 30 plus mini sods of exclusive content not available for the regular podcast listeners and an exclusive mini sode every month. And you'll get exclusive voting power to help us pick podcast topics and more. And that's with our changers tier. There's three different main tiers and then an extra uh, larger tier. But whatever tier that you join at, you will be included in this extra content and I know that many of you are wanting to go a little bit deeper. And so even though it gets a little wild in there sometimes because of how deep we go, I want you to join us there. This extra content is very special. It means a great deal to me to be a part of this community with you. And I would love to just exchange uh, ideas or perspectives that you have around these different episodes. And that's the place where we do it. So please show up to our Difference Maker community. Give us $5 out of your pocket every month. And I think that you'll have a lot of fun in there because we do. And I would love for you to join us. So go to patreon.com slash a world of difference to join us there. Welcome to the A World of Difference podcast. I'm Lori Adams Brown, and this is a podcast for those who are different and want to make a difference. Today, he's finally here, everyone, Dr. Wade Mullen, the long-awaited guest of the author of the book, Something's Not Right, Decoding the Hidden Tactics of Abuse and Freeing Yourself from Its Power. Dr. Wade Mullen needs no introduction to many of you. Um, His book that was released in October of 2020 has helped so many, including me. It was one of the first books I read after my own spiritual abuse and really gave me eyes to see what was happening And he's currently working on his second book. Wow, cannot wait. Um, We'll see when that comes out. He served 10 years in pastoral ministry and then five years as a seminary MDiv program director and assistant professor. Before he transitioned to full-time research and writing, consulting, speaking, and advocacy, he has a PhD in leadership studies and his dissertation is called Impression Management Strategies Used by Evangelical Organizations in the Wake of an Image-Threatening Event. You can actually download that dissertation for free on his website. We'll link his website in the show notes. He founded Pellucid Consulting in the fall of 2021. He provides consulting and independent assessment services for institutions. He has a Substack newsletter I highly recommend called Pellucid. And he occasionally speaks at events. Many of those events are ones you've probably heard him at. He has spoken at the Restore Conference, many other events. He works uh, when needed uh, as an institutional response specialist with Grace. And he continues to do research efforts related to abuse in the church. He, um, it was his actual work in a local church that introduced him to the needs of abuse victims and the potential for institutional betrayal and trauma when those who are supposed to protect the victim choose to protect the abusers instead. And you can see his personal story that was featured in Sojourners Magazine and also a talk he did in a conference in Chicago on his website in the About section. Highly recommend you check that out. And um, also his book, if you haven't read it, it is an honor, and I'm so excited to finally get to interview the one, the only, Dr. Wade Mullen. Dr. Wade Mullen, oh, it's so exciting to have you on the podcast talking about your book and your work today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thanks, Lori. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to, to, to be on the show with you. Well, I mean, you have no idea what an honor it is for me and our listeners around the world who have interacted with your book and your newsletter and just um, have seen you speak at conferences and um, watch videos of what you're saying. You're such a thought leader around abuse, especially abuse in the church. And so I'm really excited to talk about what is something nobody ever wants to talk about, um, but just in the nature of exposing what's really there and helping us understand how to navigate something that's very dark and horrible. Um, I just, I wonder, did you ever imagine you would be the kind of person who would be analyzing nearly a thousand cases of clergy abuse over five years? And what led you to do this kind of research? 
No, I never imagined it. Um, never set out uh, to to be in this field and to do this kind of work. Um, it is something that found me um, in a way, and it was through experiences at a local church and then through pursuing a, a PhD and doing a doctoral study on how Christian organizations use impression management strategies in the wake of a crisis, a scandal, an image-threatening event. It was through those twin experiences that I found myself linked to to these stories. And I, of course, didn't know um, how, how prevalent abuse is in Christian circles in our churches. Wasn't aware of the severity of the the harm and the trauma and and the extent of the cover up and it was all just very eye opening and disillusioning and I when I kind of walked through that and got to the other side wanted to put it behind me in many ways and at different points when I was going through the the the, the PhD work and collecting all these cases just asking myself you know why why am I doing this um, and wanted to give up because it's it was just very difficult and i had a therapist at the time Mm -hmm. who who challenged challenged me at different points to stick with it and asked me a question that has stuck with me um she said you're 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 linked to this now uh you're linked to the Mm -hmm. the stories of survivors um you're linked to this academic research what are you going to do with that link and and so that's a that's a question that I've wrestled with since and decided at that point, well, I'm not going to just bury that link and walk away from it. I'm going to try to turn it into something meaningful that can be a gift to others. And so that's so no, I didn't. It's a long answer to say no, I, I didn't set out to do this, um, but <laughs> here I am, and hopefully, um, st- stewarding kind of those experiences and that learning well in a way that's helpful to others. Oh, well, it certainly is. It's, it was very helpful to me. And your book, um, Something's Not Right, Decoding the Hidden Tactics of Abuse and Freeing Yourself from Its Power, is the first book I read right after I had been fired for calling out abuse in my church. And it just was like, I was so thirsty <laughs> for something to help me understand. And I've heard that story from so many others, my husband included. We both read your book cover to cover and underlined so many parts of it. It's so quotable, the way you just word things. And um, yeah, like I, I wanted to dig into this question first because I have an undergraduate degree in sociology. So when I read the word, the name Irving Kaufman in your book, I remember in social theory in my class, um, studying him as a social theorist and being very taken with his social theory. Um, it's very unusual, but it, I love how you apply it to this framework. It's the perfect theory to have chosen to help us understand Um, Because you referenced this, you know, you mentioned it earlier, this branch of sociology called impression management, um, which Irving Goffman, who's one of the leading proponents of symbolic interactionism, and he has this framework, dramaturgy, for everybody listening, if you're not familiar, I'll just get kind of synopsis of it, and then I'll get um, you to answer a question around it, Wade. Basically, um, Irving Goffman is saying, you know, people... Uh, we portray people as actors on a stage and their actions are shaped by the type of interaction they make with others. And so he has this, his best known work is the presentation of self in everyday life where human interaction is mediated by the use of symbols, by interpretation or ascertaining the meaning of one another's actions. And this is so critical for the, <laughs> for church abuse conversations because Goffman's framework shows us that social life is grounded on this sort of cutoff between the front and the backstage Um, And Goffman alludes that the public audience hardly has any access to the backstage and vice versa, right? So, you know, there's there's a lot of talk about celebrity pastors nowadays. I think we can imagine the stage in a lot of churches because a lot of churches actually literally have stages nowadays. And so my question for you, Wade, around this whole concept is how are we um, to look at the stage in the church compared, you know, with celebrity pastors, like I mentioned, where abuse can be this dark secret behind the curtain, and how can this whole framework help us understand what we're not seeing and what we're not supposed to see? So walk us through that and why that was a, an impactful theory for you to look at. I think I would start by mentioning how when you're in a toxic, abusive environment, 
uh, gaslighting is such a common feature of that. And so your perception mm-hmm. of what you know to be true and real is is distorted in order to confuse you because when people are confused, it's easier for them to be controlled. And and so what's 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 needed is is a lens, a pair of glasses that will help you to see uh, what's what's going on. And and what I found in Irving Goffman's work and the field of impression management and organizational impression management is a framework or a lens through which you can view just about any social social system, any social situation. And so that that metaphor of the theater play, I think, is a, is, is a great metaphor that can be applied to so many different areas of our lives. But I think it has particular uh, application in a way that's uniquely helpful to a church situation, um, because you have in, in in a very real sense <laughs> actors on a stage. You have people in positions of trust who are performing for an audience. And there are so many different, I think, dynamics that are at play that when you look at that through the lens of impression management theory, dramaturgical theory, through the lens of a theater play in that in that metaphor, I think it allows you to see so much that otherwise you wouldn't be able to see. And then that that brings clarity, that brings vo- vocabulary, that brings language which can be really useful to help you gain, again, a, an accurate view of the situation, what you've experienced, so you can actually begin to call it for what it is and describe it to others. And, and so that's, you know, that, that's, that's one way in which I found it to be really helpful to me personally as I was going through this so that I could say, here's what I think is going on and call it out and name it, um, but also... In helping other people understand the situation that they're in, I found it to be a really helpful um, f- framework. Yes, I do too. So helpful. Even you have an illustration in the book of a stage, and you show the pictures of what this can look like. And I, I just, I think language. You mentioned that that's how you start off the book, and we'll get into language in a second. But it is so helpful for us to understand through this framework. Um, But defining abuse, I would say in my experience and the aftermath of my own spiritual abuse and psychological abuse at a church um, is something we don't do very well. (laughs) Um, And so you say in your book, when someone treats you as an object, they are willing to harm for their own benefit. Abuse has occurred and that person has become an abuser. So help us understand, because we often sugarcoat this in the church, what abuse actually is. Yeah, and I think there are many different definitions of abuse, and that's partly because abuse is is complex in the in the sense that it can it can show up in a variety of different ways. It can show up in a variety of different contexts. But when um, I describe abuse in in those terms, I'm thinking about a person, the way in which a person who is abusive views others as objects and then treats people as objects uh, that can be manipulated, that can be coerced for their own benefit. You know, so there is a, there is a purpose behind it. And, and, and I think when you, when you are looking at an abusive situation or an abusive relationship, it's important to, to, to think in systems, um, to, to recognize that there are multiple things going on. And, and sometimes it's, it's hard to identify, you know, for example, the, the language that is being used that might reveal that somebody is being coerced and manipulated, that might give you an indication that this person is being viewed and treated as an object. And then it's even more difficult to discern what the purpose of that person is who's using that language, um, whether or not they actually do see this other person as an object to be to be used. And and so it's 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 beyond I guess what I would point out is it is it is beyond a a an episode or an incident. And it it takes a view that sees the 
the what's going on in between people in that in that relationship in that system the communication itself what's going on inside of people and of course that can be very difficult to discern and then recognizing what is what is happening as a result of that you know so so when i describe a, a situation or relationship or a person as abusive I'm not so much thinking about an abusive event or episode, although that that does happen. But what what is happening before and after that? Because the 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 real kind of factor that remains constant beyond the episode and in between the episodes is 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 the fear, is the sense of captivity, is the is is is, is the confusion, is the feeling of being disempowered, and this kind of realization that people have that. Maybe I am being viewed and treated as an object. Um, so, so that's a. It's when I think about abuse, there's, there's multiple layers. I guess is 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 what I would say needs to mm-hmm. come into view. Yeah, that's that's really good. You mentioned in your book um, that some of the worst forms of abuse are psychological, actually. Mm-hmm. And it's, I don't think this is what the average person thinks. I don't think that's what I used to think either. Um, cause I think we have sort of a hierarchy in our head, like sexual abuse, physical abuse, definitely like so much worse. Help us understand why psychological abuse is so damaging though. Because I think it, 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 it robs you of your, uh, sense of meeting, um, your sense of self-worth, your, your dignity, it, it erodes your identity, you know. So these are things that are very important to us. Um, these are th- these are soul level stuff, and and it it is a it is a wound that may not uh, be so easily uh, diagnosed uh, because it's at the level of the the psyche, the soul. It's your it's your inner person. Uh, that's being stalked, that's being viewed as an object, that's being harassed and manipulated. And and that may not, the, the wounds that exist there may not be evident to people who are looking at the situation or looking at your experience. But it's, it's I think that adds to the wounding um, because then you find that it's hard to communicate to other people what you've experienced. It's, it's you might find it difficult to, for other people to believe you. Um, so it just, it adds to the confusion. It adds to the feeling of being trapped. It adds to the, um, to the betrayal that you experience from others, uh, who might otherwise come to your aid if they more easily saw the wound. And so, so it's, it's, it's deeper, it's longer lasting. Um, and it is, it is, um, how how do I want to say this? Um, it, I think it, it brings this this sense of being in a in a psychic prison, this sense of being in mm-hmm. a in in a trap, and that is a terrible place to be in, because it's it's like being in a in a prison without physical walls and a prison without f- mm-hmm. physical bars. It still has that effect of okay, I'm trapped in this. I don't know how to get out of this. I it, it is having an impact on the whole of my life. I it's it's eroding me away, but it's invisible. Um, it's it's there, but I can't get out of it, and other people can't see it. So it's it's a very hopeless kind of captive place to be in. Wow, that's a great description <laughs> for somebody who's walked through psychological abuse. <clears throat> that is a great description, and I think that um, it's so important to understand how you start the book off, which is what grabbed me so much in the beginning, is about the language. Um, and so many of us coming out of an abusive situation don't even have language to describe it, but we've also often been abused with language. And you start off with the quote by Joseph Brodsky. And I have read this quote a million times and thought of it so often since you, since I read it in your book, but the quote is, you think evil is going to come into your houses wearing big black boots, but it doesn't come in like that. Look at the language. It begins in the language. 
And so you kind of unpack that in your book about how you say words lead to confusion and captivity. So would you unpack that a little bit more? What is it um, about language that confuses us and holds us captive for those who can't quite see that yet? Well, I've, I think, again, um, when you're talking about an abusive system, relationship, person, there is the language itself, um, but behind that language is a, is a purpose um, that is kept hidden. You know, there's a hidden goal, there's a hidden agenda that's informing that communication that you're receiving. You may not be aware of the purpose, the hidden commitment, the hidden goal that's viewing you as an object. But the communication, though, is going to um, be used in a way that usually coerces some kind of trust. So when I, when I talk about um, evil you know, showing up first in language and Joseph Brodsky you know, using that um, to help us understand that this is the way in which it enters into your world is through language. I think it shows up um, in the ways in which abusive people talk about themselves, you know, through self-promoting language, grandiose statements. That's where you might see, you know, narcissistic kind of uh, language that's self-promoting. But what's the purpose of that? You know, it's it, it might be in order to get other people to 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 trust um hey here's somebody who is clearly successful knows what they're doing and they're they're volunteering this information and i'm hearing this and it's it's giving me this sense of confidence in this person right but then that might then um turn into other promoting language you know so the the ways in which that person promotes themselves and the, and the language that they use the words they use might then be directed at at you in order to charm you, in order to make you feel as if you're being promoted. In you, you know, so your successes are highlighted and exaggerated, and basically you're being flattered, you're you're being complimented, and then along with that, you know, there there might be nonverbal language, uh, gift giving, communicates something, um, shows of affection, it communicates something, and when it's when that communication is in is in the hands of somebody who's viewing you as an object and their purpose is to get something from you, to disempower you so they can dispossess you of something that you have that they want, then that language is actually being used to deceive you by getting you to trust that person, but it's all a trap. So they've laid a net using this flowery language, using this self-promoting talk. They've laid a net so that you... you don't know that what you're walking into is a trap. It, I, so I use the image of a garden often uh, that somebody who's using this kind of language is creating this, 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 this garden experience. So they are leading other people to enter into this garden and giving this, this impression that the experience is going to be one, of, one of, um, of, of charm and joy and happiness and and pleasant it's all going it's, it's all pleasant but then, and and but what what is below the surface that you don't know is is a pit and at some point the the ground below you gives out and you find yourself no longer in this garden but you find yourself in this in this pit that you didn't know was there and now you're you're confused you're held captive you're surrounded by by by, by walls and so the language in a sense, is kind of the way it usually shows up is in this ingratiating talk, in this self-promoting talk that draws people into this garden. And people aren't, don't realize that perhaps behind that language is a, is, a, is a purpose. And that purpose then only reveals itself when some people, usually not everyone, but some people find themselves all of a sudden in this pit below the garden. Hmm. Yeah, but that's such a good illustration. Language. I've heard you say that. Yeah, no, it's very, very helpful because I think that's part of the cognitive dissonance. People expect abusers to be all bad <clears throat> or the abusive system to be all bad, and it's never that way or you would never walk into it. <clears throat> but um, I think that one of the things that makes it hard is in the aftermath of abuse, there's a lot of um, 
need for those who've had this kind of, you know, religious trauma, spiritual abuse, psychological abuse, whatever form of abuse they've endured to make sense of it all, this whole sense-making concept that you talk about too in your book. And and yet in religious environments, in Christianity in particular, churches will often shut down survivors' voices by calling it gossip when they're trying just to process what happened with others and process the language and process that garden being laid and that they were in a trap. They're trying to process it and they're told they're gossiping. Um, how does this continue to wound and traumatize and even abuse survivors when they're just trying to thrive and flourish in the aftermath? Well, it, it, it keeps them from being able to experience um, recovery. You know, if they're, if they're already in a toxic situation, an abusive situation, where um, there are um, rules against uh, gossip, and there's typically in those situations a lot of a lot of rules, a lot of unstated expectations, so people don't know when they're crossing a line or not. So they're in this kind of system where they're wrapped in in in, in constraint, and and they feel like they're always walking on a razor's edge. So. They've, they've likely, even if they haven't identified it, already experienced, experienced harm, have already been viewed and treated as an object. And it, it then, I, what I see, um, a, one of the purposes of that toxic organization, that abusive organization, the abusive leader, is to keep people from telling their their stories is to disconnect them from people who might provide understanding and provide support so these are silencing measures which is the opposite of what people need who have been harmed who have been mistreated in order to recover Um, they need safety they need to be able to tell uh, their story and their experience to 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 others who might be able to validate that, affirm that, uh, disentangle all the confusion and all the gaslighting. So sometimes these rules are in place and they, and they have the effect of casting a shadow over the, over the culture, over the organization. And one of the books that's been helpful to me um, is titled Meeting the Ethical Challenges of Leadership. Um, by Craig Johnson, and the subtitle I like, it's, the subtitle is Casting, Casting Lighter Shadow. And when ethical leaders cast light, then people don't feel as if they have to hold their stories and their experiences close to their chest. They don't have to keep secrets. They don't have to be afraid of expressing appropriate dissent. They don't have to worry about what, what's going to happen if they ask, ask a question or voice disagreement. But when leaders cast a shadow, the, the impact of that is that everybody then keeps everything close to them um, because they learn that if they, if they tell their story, if they speak out, if they, if they use their voice and their agency, it's going to result in further harm. So they live in these in these shadows, and and so, yeah. So the gossip um, and the emphasis on that, when it's in toxic organizations, it's usually not well defined. Um, it's it's applied to to followers, but not to the leaders. So I've often seen that leadership <laughs> that is yep. you know trying to quell gossip, they themselves talk freely and very poorly about other people in their mm-hmm. absence. Um, so yeah. Yeah, definitely my experience, unfortunately, which is confusing. And part of what you say that language does is it's confusing you. And I was definitely a part of being confused by the fact that the lead pastor who was abusive toward me was like, you'll get fired for gossip. But he was constantly name calling and trashing other people to me and, you know, small behind this curtain type environments. It just is very confusing. Uh, but impression management is is a huge part of what's going on, right? That's what you talk about in the book. And so you you have I have this quote that you wrote in your book: the tactics of impression management used by organizations to cover up their wrongs 
are the same tactics used by everyday abusers throughout the world and that have been used by evil powers throughout history. This is a mind-blowing thing if you haven't seen it before, but I think once you see it, you see it, and you see it everywhere it's being used. So for those who don't see it yet, could you walk us through the similarities between what might be happening in a, you know, an abusive church situation and what has happened with evil powers around the world? How are there similar tactics they're using? Yeah, and I, and I came to that realization after uh, walking through the Bible and identifying these impression management tactics that I saw throughout the Bible, um, looking at narratives from history um, of dictatorial leaders and and all kinds of abuses, and then primarily though looking at all of these cases of of pastors within the United States who have been arrested for some kind of crime over the past five years or so. And, and realizing that the, the same impression management tactics that organizations might use to save face and to, and, and to get through a scandal and to basically manipulate people into maintaining their loyalty and their followership are the same tactics that individuals use um, in cases of all kinds of abuse. And so you see a lot of overlap um, between um, organizations and individuals that are abusive who use self-promoting talk and other promoting talk in order to coerce trust. And then once trust is coerced, you see this kind of language that begins to dismantle uh, someone's external world and begins to tell, let's say in an organizational setting, members uh, not to read certain books, uh, not to trust certain voices, um, not to um, go to therapy, right? So there, so you, but you also see that at the individual level where in an, individual, in, in an abusive relationship uh, between one person and another, the abusive person might begin to, in the course of the relationship, cut that person off from friends and family members, then there's this dismantling of someone's internal world. And I think you can see that at an organizational level where people are being taught then to, uh, followers in a church are being taught not to trust um, their, their own beliefs, uh, not, to, uh, not to have any kind of confidence in their own values that they brought into the, in, in, into the organization or into the church. And you see that at the individual level, too. So you, there's all this overlap then, even in the ways in which people are being being dismantled. Um, but then in that place of dismantling, then often this is where people experience um, the, 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 the worst kind of harm because they've been dismantled. They've of, often been isolated through uh, the ways in which trust is coerced. And then the abusive institution or the abusive person acts in ways that are intimidating, acts in ways that are threatening, uses fear and power to control people, uh, to ask them, to coerce them into doing things that they wouldn't otherwise do. And, and, and then from there, there's this silencing that happens. Okay, now somebody, there's, bound, there's boundary crossing behavior. There's someone who's been victimized. They have a story. And there's a need to make sure that that person doesn't tell anyone else. So the silencing tactics that organizations use to silence followers um, are very similar to the silencing tactics individual perpetrators use to silence those they've they've victimized. And then, you know, then then there's the ways in which people and organizations use defensive tactics to try to escape accountability when a story does come out or when they're confronted. And so I show how can I, all these tactics throughout the book are, are described. But mm -hmm. a, a light bulb moment for me was seeing how there's such similarity between the ways in which organizations use these kind of impression management tactics over time and in a way that reveals itself as a pattern and how individual abusers use many of the same kinds of tactics and in the same kind of way and in the same kinds of situational settings in order to, in order to offend and in order to get away with that. Yeah. It's so hard to see when you're in it. I think that's the hard part. But once you're 
on the outside, it's a little easier to, to see. But part of what happens is, like you mentioned, um, is the silence, right? So other people inside might be seeing their part, but they don't realize other people are experiencing it because of the silence. That you'll get fired for gossip policy is okay. great in a tyrannical system to keep the narrative in your favor. So you, I have this quote from your book where you say, silence grants evil exactly what it needs to be effective. And you also say, you must recognize that it is not just those doing the hiding that are who are at fault, but also those who benefit from the abuser's show and want it to continue. So, ouch, for those of us who have been bystanders and not said anything, but maybe help us understand the dangers of the complicity that we can be a part of and that by being a silent bystander, we're on this, you know, performance team that Irvin Goffman calls it. Yeah, and... It- and it, and it is an ouch, you know, because it, it can be difficult to kind of step back and from this balcony perspective, uh, look at uh, maybe your, your prior role in a system like that and, and how you may have contributed just by um, at one point being sincerely converted to the system and to the way in which it did things or even if you weren't sincerely converted, uh, you were remaining compliant. So that's even using some of Goffman's uh, language in his book, Asylum. But one thing that I will mention, though, is that the often those who are in those settings and they aren't speaking out, it's because they've been silenced, right? Um, and... I think it's important primarily for those who are in positions of authority and responsibility who are bystanders in the sense that they perhaps are members of the board or they are staff, they are, um, they have access to the abusive leader and they, they choose to stand by and to give passage to the abuse because, and there may be all different reasons for this, but they don't, they choose maybe not to believe uh, what they've heard or what they see, or they choose to protect themselves. They choose to, uh, in some cases, uh, enable the abuse because they benefit. And this is what I'm getting at in the book. They benefit in some way, maybe financially or uh, through reputation or through their own access to power, they benefit in some way um, by the performance, uh, by the abusive leader's um, per- performance and actions and quote unquote success. And it's those people in particular uh, that I'd, I'm encouraging them to see the the damage that a silent bystander. Uh, can cause not only in permitting that abuse safe passage but also in communicating to those who have been harmed to survivors we don't believe you or we do believe you and your story just doesn't matter yeah it's so true and once you if you've experienced abuse and you've had people be silent and um say, well, I've never experienced him that way or or the things that people might say, or especially when they have seen it and they still choose not to speak, that can be one of the most re-traumatizing things for people in a church environment in particular. And I hear quite a bit about that. And I've had my own experience with it. It's so important for us to, when you see something, say something, it's not easy to do, but it's definitely a a clarion call we have right now for the church. Um, what what should we look for, though, to discern and stop abuse? For those who are saying, I want to help stop this, what should they look for? Because you say um, in the book, some have compared getting truth out of an abuser to nailing jello to a wall, because if they're caught, they'll use any tactic necessary to wiggle free, to evade accusation, to save face, to preserve their power and influence. So If pastors who abuse are so skilled at lying to evade these accusations and preserving their power at all costs, how can we find the truth and hold them accountable in order to protect others from being abused? That's a good question. I I mean, I I think you look for the deception, 
uh, all throughout the, the, the pattern. And that can be difficult, but I think it, one thing you can do is take an inventory of uh, statements that you find to be um, an exaggeration of the truth or a mixing of truth and falsehood, uh, because sometimes it's just kind of like just right over that line. But it's enough to raise a flag in you like, well, I don't know that that's really true, you know. And, and so I recommend just take, t- take note of that and then see if that deception shows up over time and in a way that kind of looks like a pattern. Um, see if that person is one way toward those they view as having less power than them. You know, maybe they're, they're, they're more willing to display their anger and they're more willing to be threatening and intimidating when they're meeting with people who have less power. But when they're meeting with others who have more power, or let's say the, the, the if it's a church, the, the congregation, they appear to be the exact opposite, right? So it's it's sort of this intimidation and this anger under control that's used as a weapon in certain mm. situations. Um, so you can look for those kind of things. And then even in that, um, look for the deception. So when somebody is seeking to control others through intimidation, through condemnation, through shaming them. Often then there's deception that's even in that language. So they want somebody who's raising questions and is expressing dissent or sharing their story, speaking out. They, they, they want that person and other people to see that truth teller as either mad and irrational or bad in some way, uh, having some kind of character flaw or out for revenge. But there's a deception there often. There's things that are being said about that person that aren't true. Um, or maybe there's something in there that yeah might be connected to some kind of truth, but it's being blown up uh, out of proportion. So there's de- what I'm saying is that you can look for these these de- these deceptive tactics that are kind of attached to the communication in different situations across a a, a pattern. And then I would say how how does somebody respond or how does an institution respond when they don't get what they want when mm-hmm. uh, when something they're trying to change fails when when a goal they're trying to meet uh, it, when it doesn't happen do they condemn other people do they blame other people do they become angry do they do they just try harder do they run people into the ground how do they respond when people ask hard questions? How do they respond when, 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 when people speak up and dissent in a meeting? Do they, do they pull you aside and say, you know, you shouldn't have said that in front of, you know, the team? You know, if you have a concern, just come to me, right? How, what do they do with messages that they don't want? Do they minimize those messages in ways that are coercive and manipulative? What do they do with that? So I think there's, there's just questions you can ask and clues that you can look for that can help you discern whether or not a relationship or um, a, a system, an environment is abusive. That's very good. That's so good. I can see all of that in so many scenarios, including my own. Um, you know, I think what's hard is um, we are socialized to trust pastors, right? And we're socialized to believe they have our best interest in mind. And it feels wrong, like it's just us when we have those questions about a pastor. You say in your book, the best places to hide are those least likely to be searched and among people least likely to suspect abuse. And so because we're socialized to trust pastors and believe pastors, especially these lead pastors of really large churches, because it seems like they're doing something right to grow a church this large. So maybe we're the wrong ones for questioning. So why is it that this is exactly the tactic an abuser would use, growing a large church in order to hide? And what do we need to be more alert about in order to be safe and prevent abuse in these scenarios? I think part of it, you know, can be seen through the lens of, of Goffman's, you know, dramaturgical theory. And and he at one point talks about the ways in which self-promoting language is, is, is used and how people will volunteer information about themselves. And they'll do more of that if, if they know that, that there's, there's something about who they really are 
that is different than what other people expect them to be. So the more that that gap exists between how people see them and who they really are, they more, the more they feel the need to volunteer information about themselves in order to maintain an in, in, in image. And, you know, I, I think that um, when, when, we, when we see that happening, uh, when, somebody rec- when somebody who's trying to do that is trying to create this image of themselves in order maybe to hide something that is true about them, then they might identify a church or a position of trust, a, a public-facing role as, as the perfect role in order to occupy, to, to hide. Um, and it may be something that they want to hide from themselves, uh, not just something that they want to hide from other people. Uh, so I've talked to people who were uh, seeking out some kind of pastor role and in asking them, you know, why do you want to do this? I've, I've heard some troubling answers over time, you know, answers like, well, I've just never really been respected. And, and, and I just think if I were in this kind of role, people would respect me. Or somebody told me once, you know, some, someone said this to me, you know, hey, you know, someone told me once that um, I will never be able to um, um, accomplish, you know, whatever it is, right? So they set out to prove that person wrong, and they thought that being a pastor would be a way in which to prove these other people in their life wrong, right? So the position, the role, um, and the, the, the trust that, 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 that comes with, and the, the kind of the sacredness that, that comes with, can be attractive to people who want to find an, an image, right, that they can then present to other people as a way of, 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 of hiding. Does that yeah. make sense? <clears throat> that does make sense. So I think a church and a, and a pastor kind of becomes one of, those, one of those possible roles that somebody who is, who is already um, in you know, already abusive and is already engaging in these patterns of deception might seek to occupy. Yeah. Unfortunately, something good that is easily preyed upon and, um, and can easily hurt many people, which is a hard, hard truth that we have to face. I have this one last question for you, and then, um, we're going to save another one for our Patreon supporters. But if you could point to somebody who is maybe looking for resources, they've walked through abuse and they're wanting resources both to learn from. So it's a two-part question. What resources would you point them to? And then how also do you advise people to engage with people who are still in that system but don't quite see it? Um, Because that can be one of the harder parts. So one would be the resource aspect, and then the other is how do you advise them to interact with people who are still complicit in the environment? Yeah, and I, and I guess the answer to both is is sort of the same. It's it's through education and through resources often that our eyes are open and we begin to see what we uh, couldn't see before. And with that, you know, comes so many other gifts. And I I really have benefited from the work of Dr. Diane Lingberg, um, not only her recent book Redeeming Power. Um, but her book, Suffering in the Heart of God, and her YouTube lectures, and she has many. Uh, she talks about narcissism and the systems it breeds. And one of her older YouTube uh, lectures that I, that I found to be really helpful um, and encourage people to watch. So that, you know, so she would be one, one voice. Uh, Chuck DeGroat has written um, a lot about narcissism in churches and also has great things to say i think about spiritual abuse and psychological and emotional abuse Um, and then along those lines you know just thinking about psychological emotional abuse and understanding that spiritual abuse or at least the way that i understand it is a is a type of psychological abuse i think it's helpful to to gain some understanding just about psychological and emotional abuse in general and one of the books that I found to be be helpful um, is called Stalking the Soul. 
Um, and it's an older book. I think it was written in the 1990s by Marie France, and I can't remember her, her, her last name. But if you Google the title of the book, it, it should come up. But that's a book about em- emotional abuse yeah. and the erosion of identity. Um, and there's books on v- verbal abuse as well. And uh, the verbally abusive relationship is one. And that's, I think, helpful because the way in which spiritual abuse kind of manifests itself is so often verbally. Um, and so I think there's a lot of overlap between verbally abusive relationships and the spiritually abusive context. A Blind Betrayal uh, by Jennifer Fried and all of her work on um, betrayal, blindness, and I, I think is helpful because betrayal is such an important concept. And as it relates to you know helping other people who are kind of in in the system, um, I one tip that I would give is sometimes it's it's hard to go directly to people, especially if you are in that system or still are, and to tell them what you know to be true or what you experienced, because they might have been told by leadership or they might um, come to this conclusion themselves that well. You know, you know, this person just is is jaded, or they're bitter, or they just aren't seeing things correctly. They're too close to this the, the situation, whatever it might be. It's easy for them to discredit you. But if you say, "Hey, you know, here's a here, here's a talk um, on YouTube that I think you should watch. You don't have to agree with it, um, but I just." think it would be helpful if you watched it because if, if if somebody watches or reads content from another person who's completely separate from that situation and they and what that person is describing resonates with them then that can be um, that that can be eye-opening so that's one way in which you might be able to communicate to those who are already in a system and maybe they don't want to that maybe they aren't listening to you directly, but perhaps they'd be open to another voice. That's really good advice. And it resonates <laughs> when you've been discredited. It's so easy to discredit a whistleblower when silencing has been such a part of your technique already. Um, it's pretty easy to say that person mm-hmm. is disgruntled or bitter and people believe them. I know I did when I first came into my job. There were people that were described that way and I believed it wholeheartedly and didn't want to hear their story. It's a pretty magic way to discredit a whistleblower but um sending them a youtube video is a really great idea are there any that you would recommend offhand um so diane diane langberg's you know youtube videos on narcissism and churches i think it's helpful because often what people are in is a narcissistic system and so i think it's helpful to see her you know describe the the uh, the symptoms of a narcissistic sim- uh, system, you know, and, and 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 what that what that looks like. Um, so that that would be helpful. And then there's a lot of like podcasts and and YouTube lectures that are um, podcasts and lectures that are available on on on, on YouTube. So even Chuck DeGroat's kind of work is on is on YouTube as well. Um, let me think if there's anything else. You know, another one. Um, that I would recommend. Um, her name is uh, is escaping me, um, but she wrote the book "Is Nothing Sacred." Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah her her okay. name's escaping me. Um, Marie we'll Fortune, up. Dr. Marie Fortune. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll definitely link all that in the show notes. We had Chuck DeGroat and Diane Lamberg on the show. And so helpful for me. Okay. Yeah. I would say your book, their, her book, Redeeming Power, his book, When Narcissism Comes to Church, and then Scott McKnight and Laura Berenger, who were on the podcast too, A Church Called Tobe. Those were the four oh, yeah. that I that just impacted That's me cool. so greatly and I've recommended to a lot of people. We'll link all that in the show notes for those of you who haven't heard of any of this and this is the first time. But thank you so much for being on today. If you're a Patreon supporter, we're going to ask him one other question. Um and so join us there if you're a Patreon supporter. But just thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Let us know where we can find you for those who want to follow and get your newsletter and all that. 
Yeah, thanks, Lori. Um, I have a website, wadetmullen.com, and so p- people can you know find me there. And then I have a Twitter uh, handle, I think is Wade Mullen, just my name. And sometimes I'm on Facebook and Instagram, so I do have accounts there as well. Um, but I've been on a bit of a hiatus from social media for, for, for some time now. Um, but I have content on there if people would like to explore further. Dr. Wade Mullen, he's just not only researched this so thoroughly, both in his PhD dissertation work, but also since then in writing this book, Something's Not Right, Decoding the Hidden Tactics of Abuse and Freeing Yourself from Its Power, with a foreword from Dr. Diane Lingberg, who is obviously the queen of all of this conversation in so many ways, Um, with the many decades of work she's done on this um, area of abuse, especially abuse in the church. But I'm really not kidding you when I say I pretty much outline, I mean, underline the whole book and wrote so much in the margins as I was processing my own situation. And it was giving me language and giving me eyes to see what I had walked through. I saw a little bit on my own. I think often we do, but it was somebody with this expertise, with this much research in his background and writing it out in a book with um, not only the sociological framework of Irving Goffman, but also just having understood it himself as a survivor and having walked through this with so many survivors and churches. And um, and I'm, I'm just going to quote a few parts. Chapter two is all about charms. And if you have worked with somebody who's charms um, are still used as a way to say there's no way they would have abused because they come across as so charming and they did to you in the beginning and your grooming phase as well. Um, This chapter two on charms is particularly insightful. One of the things he says in the in uh, page 33 is excessive kindness can cover a hidden pit. Favors can camouflage a net. I remember our last meeting with um, my the two pastors who abused me and then one of them, uh, the wife who had been my friend. And the conversation was just, just let him bless you. Almost like that was the role he was supposed to play of ingratiation. And, and Wade goes on to say, ingratiation through charms, flattery, favors, alliances, exploits our desire for acceptance, our value for kindness, our acceptance of favors and our occasional need for another's help. And essentially what he's saying is this ingratiation exploits our need for help, our natural human longing to to have help. And if you're caught in a situation where you're somewhat vulnerable or you're struggling in some way, um, it can be a pattern of uh, abusive leaders to sort of pounce on that weakness and say, oh, I can help. Let me be the savior and ingratiate and say, I'll And sometimes it can be very grandiose, promising the world. And so that can be particularly harmful if one is in a situation where you're vulnerable, whether it's in a ministry situation or not, and you're brought into a new one under the charms of this type of individual, and then you're also being hurt. It can be a way of not understanding that you're being injured because you were so ingratiated. Um, Dr. Wade Mullen really unpacks a lot of this in the book. I really could not say enough good things about it, how he under, he describes the show, the stage of, um, the first chapter, the show must go on, um, even, uh, dismantling your inner world, your external world. He has several diagrams and, and charts dismantling your inner world on page 71. He describes how supportive relationships, Sources of understanding, institutional support are all external factors. Um, but, you know, inside the circle, there's this self respect identity agency that's your internal world. So there's this constant confusion of your inner world is consisting of private, often hidden areas of your life that typically you only share with those you trust, like your emotions. 
Um, and so he says in here, yeah, you share your emotions, your beliefs, your hopes, your memories, and so on. And your external world is made up of the public, not so easily hidden areas of your life, typically experienced by others like family members, teachers, coaches, colleagues, therapists, etc. So in an ideal environment, your connections to the external world can serve as healthy supports to your internal world, and together they form this tapestry of your unique and special life. However, what he says here is, as in an, in an abusive environment, the external world is dismantled in order to gain easier access to your internal world, which the abuser also seeks to dismantle. That's part of what uh, it feels like being gaslit in these situations is you're being broken down moment by moment strategically. And so it's often not until looking back on a situation that you can put those pieces together and say, oh, wow, I had no idea that a trap was being laid for me. So if you are one of those people and you're in the middle of that, I highly recommend picking up this book. If you're someone who's working through sense making, of what happened to you and you don't understand what just happened. Um, you find yourself wanting to tell the story over and over again to even figure out how to put the words together. And you're in that process of, um, you know, Dr. Diane Lamberg describes that, that trauma survivors need to verbalize that over and over to share the story, to start making sense of it. I highly encourage you to pick up this book to help you have language to understand what you have gone through and how you can move forward in a healthier way and heal. Dr. Wade Mullen has given so many of us that gift. He's also given the gift to those of us in churches trying to figure out how we can put systems in place to prevent these horrible traumatic situations from happening. Religious trauma, spiritual abuse, psychological, emotional, verbal abuse. These are real things happening in some places and our systems are often encouraging it attracting these abusive leaders and silencing anyone who would want to speak out against it in order to help find a healthier way forward for all of us. So what a gift it was to have him on the show. If you think you're imagining it and you're not sure, pick up the book and read it so you can find out what if what you're experiencing really truly is an abusive situation. And if you're a person who wants to be an advocate, you have a friend maybe who's been in a church and given an NDA and doesn't know how to process what happened and it was um, maybe abusive. Really, I cannot recommend his book more and also his Substack newsletter. We'll link his website in the show notes so you can find all of those. And if your church is experiencing something like this, he does on occasion help consult with churches to discern um, as a scholar and academic, and this is his area of expertise, whether what has gone on there has been abusive or, or not. And so I highly recommend you reaching out to him as a consultant. He's absolutely one of the best. So it is my just joy to offer you Dr. Wade Mullen today, a breath of fresh air for all of us who have been in situations where we didn't know what it was and giving us the words. Could not be more grateful for his book and what it has done for me, so many others, and my husband who also read it very recently as well. And it's brought us healing. It's brought us a way forward. And it's helped us to want to be the kind of people who help prevent this from happening to others. Silence only makes the oppression worse. It only enables the one who is doing the abuse to keep doing it. And that ultimately is not good for them or any of their future victims that they will hurt. So getting loud is not something we often talk about um, enough. And we're told just, you know, keep the peace or, you know, be quiet. Why are you talking about these things? Don't slander. Don't gossip. It's important to understand the definitions of gossip and slander what it really means to be kind and not just nice, why silence is actually sinful in some cases, and calling out what's going on and helping our brothers and sisters who are injuring others to get the help that they need by making the hard call of removing them from ministry when they are too stuck in their addiction to power to do it for themselves. Um, these are the kind of conversations that come out of a book like this and from the work that Dr. Wade Mullen is doing with such trauma-informed, compassionate care and um, intellectual scholarship based on much, much research. Um, looking forward to his next book, but if you haven't read this one, please pick it up. Let us know what you think. I'd love to interact with you on our Facebook group about it. 
Um, I know it's going to make a difference in many of your lives, wherever you are around the world. And once again, thanks for listening. Thanks for being a part of this community, a community of healers, a community of people who are making a difference, a community of people who are trying to be kind and loving and accepting and inclusive of those right in front of us. None of us can do all of this without each other. That's why we have each other, and that's why this community is so beautiful. And I'm so glad that Dr. Wade Mullen was able to be with us today, challenging us, encouraging us to move forward together and and do our parts, our small parts of our little corners of the world all together. I'm so grateful for each of you for listening and for engaging in these episodes. And if this one in particular would be helpful to somebody that you know, please share it. Dr. Wade Mullen is the kind of leader we want shared out there and his voice has really impacted so many. So please do that and let us know if you enjoyed this or if it challenged you or if you disagreed, hang out with us on our Facebook group. We'd love to have you there. Take care, everybody. Bye. As we're finishing this episode, if you're thinking, I really wish I could learn more or go a little bit deeper. Well, that's what our Difference Maker community is for. I would love to welcome you in to join the rest of us there. Once again, um, it's only $5 a month to join the price of a latte at your local coffee shop. You can join at our Changers tier. Difference Makers is a community that really means so much to me. It's very special because each time I have a guest on the show, I record something um, outside of what we give to just the regular podcast audience where we go a little bit deeper and then I post those video episodes in this community and we can discuss them. But also at the very uh, beginning tier, which is our changers tier of this community, you'll get exclusive voting power and help pick podcast topics that give us you know, more of what we want from your perspective. You'll have access to exclusive um, 30 plus mini sods that aren't out there for the general public. And you'll get every month an exclusive monthly bonus mini sode. At our Groundbreakers level, which is $10 a month, you can join and get all of that, but also priority access to submit questions to the podcast. And you'll get an additional two exclusive monthly bonus mini sods. And at our Trailblazers tier, which is $15 a month, the price of three lattes a month, um, you can get all of that plus also three exclusive monthly bonus minisodes um, and a patron shout out. So I would love for you to join us at any of those tiers. Um, it'll help you come into this community, be in the midst of all of us, other difference makers, and we'd love to hear your perspective. I certainly would. It's a place to engage more with me and the audience around what you like, what you're resonating with, and once again, go deeper with each of our guests. So please join us in this membership community. I would love to hear your perspective and love to share this extra content with you. So show up at patreon.com slash a world of difference.